This is D.A. Williams, teaching pastor of Higher Residence Coalition, and I want to thank you for listening in to the webcast today. Emergent Ministries is the media outreach of the coalition, and it serves as your online portal for transformational living. You see, it is our belief that you are a person of potential, and it is our aim to provide you with practical principles to help you to both discover and develop that potential. Now, at the end of the webcast today, I'll provide additional information about how you can learn more about the ministry, as well as sign up for a monthly newsletter which contains study guides, teachings, and other resources to assist you in your personal development. But right now, let's listen in to the message and experience transformation. Of the world. Jesus, the light of the world. You remember a couple of, of weeks ago in, in starting as we're doing this Advent chore se- season, I talked about the power of the prophetic word. Somebody say the prophetic word. Everything that happened in the life of the ministry of Jesus, everything that he accomplished was done to fulfill the prophetic word. So we'll read over and over and over in the Gospels that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by. It's good to know that in our Christian experience, the things that we encounter, the things that that God leads us to do, the things that God does in us, they don't happen by chance. God is involved. Somebody say, God is involved. Yeah, yeah. Searching what? First Peter says, 11. This isn't the message, this is just to kind of bring everybody up to speed. But Peter says, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ, which was in them, was signifying when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed, somebody say revealed, that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost, sent down from heaven things that angels desire to look into. Our salvation, our redemption is so powerful. There is so much in the gospel. There is so much in the message of God's redeeming grace that hopefully we don't take it for granted. So much. Angels desire to look into the stuff that we are involved in. I love it. Peter goes on, and he makes this statement. He said that you need to know this, that no prophecy of Scripture, remember he said that and we looked at that, no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Holy men of God spake as they were moved, as they were borne along, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. No prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Prophecy never came by the will of man. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so when we begin to look at the prophetic nature of Scripture, I'm not talking about some of the things that go on in the name of prophecy and prophets in a lot of the modern-day Uh, movements that we see. But I'm talking about prophecy that is deeply rooted and grounded in the text. Somebody say in the text. It's rooted in the text. No prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Luke chapter 2, if you have a Bible, you can turn there with me. We're going to pick up with Jesus, the light of the world. Can I teach this morning a little bit? All right, thanks. I appreciate you. 
Luke chapter 2. We read the story about the birth of Christ. We know how the angel Gabriel had showed up and had given a word to old Zach. Y'all remember Zachariah. Zach was ministering in the temple, and the angel gave him a word. The angel gave Zachariah a word. Zachariah did not believe the word, and what happened? He lost his voice. Because whenever we don't believe the word that God has given, we lose our voice. I ask you a question. Has the church, is the church losing its voice? Hmm. Luke chapter 2, verse 29. They bring the child Jesus into the temple to be circumcised. He's about to become a part of the covenant community of God. Isn't it great to be a part of a covenant community? Verse 26, well, let's start at 25. It says, behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the man was just and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed. Somebody say revealed. We, we keep seeing this thing about things being revealed. It was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace. I love King Jimmy. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. One of the first things we see about the ministry of Jesus, about the advent, about the coming of the Lord, he's coming as a light to bring revelation, not only to Israel, but to the Gentiles. Jesus is coming as the light. Somebody say the light. The light of the world. Now, it was revealed. What is revelation? What is this revealing that we see? Revelation is just simply a disclosure. It's an appearing. It's a coming. It's a manifestation. It's something being revealed. It's not something being added to Scripture. It's eyes being opened to see what is in Scripture. So a lot of, you know, again, a lot of times, and as I said, you know, I'm, I, 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 you know, looked at the global charismatic movements. And a lot of times people come up with new, quote, unquote, revelations. That's not what Scripture is talking about, revelations. Revelation is bringing something out that is already there. Think Martin Luther Reformation. Martin Luther wasn't the first person to realize that the just shall live by faith. It had just been buried within church history. God gave Martin Luther revelation, the just shall live by faith. It's time to move away from all this other stuff that's been added. The just shall live by faith. Think John Wesley, grace. John Wesley wasn't the first person to come up with grace. Grace had always been. But grace had been buried. And so God gave John Wesley a revelation of grace a revelation of holiness, and God continually moves, revealing what's already there. Does this make sense? In the manifestation of God to his people, light had ever been a symbol of his presence. Think about creation. In the beginning, God said, let there be light, and there was Light. Now, it wasn't because God needed light to see what he was about to do. Light just happens to be a first principle of God. God always likes light. One of the things light does, light separates from darkness. Can I get a witness? All right. Light had ever been a symbol of his presence. In the beginning, light had shone out of darkness. Light had been enshrouded in the pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Remember the wilderness journey? God showed up in a pillar of cloud, fire by night. Why? To give light 
to the people. Light produces direction. If you don't have light, you can't see where you're going. Oh, I'm enjoying this. Light has shone out of darkness. Light had been enshrouded in a pillar of cloud. Light blazed with awful grandeur about the Lord on Mount Sinai. Light rested over the mercy seat in the tabernacle. Light filled the temple of Solomon in his dedication. Light shone on the hills of Bethlehem when the angels brought the message of redemption to the watching shepherds. Seems like God has a preoccupation with light. Oh, my. Oh, my. I love light. Revelation. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 6, brings out a very interesting, very interesting point. He prophesied. Isaiah was a prophet, right? He prophesied. He said, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand and will keep you and give you for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles. So in the embodiment of Israel's prophets and their prophetic utterances concerning the Messiah, light was a primary characteristic. Are y'all still with me? Light. In these words, he's. He's applying to the Messiah a prophecy that was familiar to Israel. Isaiah and the prophets are dealing with light. And somebody's thinking, but what does that have to do with Jesus? And my answer is, I'm so glad you asked. Turn to John chapter 1. I'm closing. Number all righty. It's good to have help. I'm glad to help. All righty. I bless you. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. We know that. And the Word became flesh. Mm, amen. Nothing like a fleshed out Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for witness to bear witness of the light (laughs) That all men through him, who is the him, the light, who is Jesus, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lights every man that comes into the world. In Jesus is life. And that life is the light of men. This is the life of God manifested through the Son. This is not human natural life. This is the life of God, better known as eternal life. Hmm. Somebody said, you paid all that money, and y'all, you can't do no better than that. That's what, Josh, that's what Pastor Josh said. Oh, okay. We'll talk later. <laughs> John was not the light. John came to bear witness of the light. In Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men. Now let's go and look at John chapter 9, because there's four things about this light that I want to share with you that I want you to think about. Just four. Only. Amazing, isn't it? As Jesus was passing by, there was a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples, say the disciples, 
Now, I know y'all have read this, but let's read it again. Let's read it with fresh eyes. His disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now let's connect the dots. Here is a man born blind. The disciples come to Jesus and they ask this really interesting question. The question was, who did sin? This man or his parents that he was born blind. See, the first thing that light does, light begins to deal with error. Somebody say error. Now somebody say, well, how do you get that out of that? Watch. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Because in the Jewish mind, sin was always punished in this life. So if this man were born blind, if he were born with an affliction, if he were born with a disease, either he sinned or his parents sinned, and this is a judgment of God upon the sin. Jesus has to correct the error that people have regarding the work of God. Who sinned, this man or his parents? Jesus said, neither. Now, remember, the scriptures were not written in chapters and verses with exclamation points and periods. They were written as units of thought. So what Jesus says now in verse 3, neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. Jesus is not saying it wasn't this man or his parents that sinned, but that the works of God could be made manifest in him. Jesus is not saying the man was born blind so that God's work can be made manifest in him. What he's saying is, Neither the man nor his parents, but to clear up the misunderstanding that people have about the works of God, I must work the works of him that sent me. Neither the man nor his parents sin, but so that the work of God can be made manifest in him, I must work the works of him that sent me. Because God is not the author of sin, sickness, disease, and poverty. It's the work of the devil. Somebody said, oh, Lord, he done went to preaching about the devil again. Yes, it's the work of the devil. Sin, sickness, and disease came into the world through the transgression of Adam through which the devil was behind. So when it comes to dealing with these things, let's not blame God. Oh, it must be God. Well, that's the work of God. You know, God going to get some glory out of your suffering. No. Now, God can make all things work together for good for those that love him. God can, in the suffering, turn it into good. But God's not the author. That's why Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. So he did what? He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He fed the homeless. He delivered those that were bound because why? That is the work of God. And so the light of Jesus reveals what the work of God is. Does this make sense? All righty then. Moving right along. So when he had thus spoke, spoke and he spat on the ground and he made clay of the spittle and he anointed the eyes of the blind man. Oh, that didn't really happen. That's just a metaphor. No, it really happened. And said to him, now you go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is my interpretation of sin. So he went his way, therefore, and washed, and he came seeing. Oh, now what's the next thing Jesus starts dealing with? Jesus starts dealing with the simplicity of faith. Somebody say faith. faith. This is how easy God has made it. God makes this real easy. We make it difficult. The man's born blind. Jesus spits in the dirt. How many of y'all would like to have a pastor, a teacher, an evangelist, an apostle or a prophet come up and spit in the dirt and put mud on your eyes? How many of y'all would go for that? I didn't think so. 
<laughs> but that's what Jesus did. Jesus has really strange ways of doing stuff. He likes to confound the wisdom of the wise. Never mind. Never mind. He spits in the dirt, makes mud, puts it on his eyes, and then says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And, and so what happened? The man went, washed, came back sin. Jesus said, go wash. The man went and washed, and he came back sin. How simple can God make this thing? You need, you need sight? Okay. Go wash. The man went, washed, came back sin. He makes it so simple. We would have had 750 rules about how to go and wash. We would have had a whole book on how to do what God said to do. God said, go wash. He went, he washed, he received the same. Why do, what is it about people? What is it about us that we have to complicate things? It's like Jesus said, go make disciples. I will develop an eight-week course for you to learn how to go and make a disciple. Jesus said, go make disciples. Never mind. Never mind. Just forget I didn't say anything. Somebody said, I already did. I know. All right. So here's faith. Somebody say faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet revealed to the senses, right? So God says, go do something, and he doesn't ask us. He does not ask us to figure out how to do it. He said, go. Go and do this. And he went and did it, and God confirmed the word. When God tells you to do something, pastor, don't worry about how it's going to get done. You walk in obedience to God, and God will unfold it bit by bit. I mean, does this make sense? I'm just wondering. Maybe I'm all alone in this. I don't know. But God, I had this great financial need. Okay, I got a solution for that too. Give. <laughs> but, but you don't understand. I need something, right? So God says, give. Why? Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, men will give into your bosom. And at the same time, let me remind you, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever man sows, that shall he also reap. So you sow bad seed, you're going to get a bad harvest. Oops. Oops. There it is. All right, so he shows the simplicity of faith. He corrects our erroneous ideas about the nature of God, and then he shows the simplicity of faith, right? Then the trouble starts, because wherever there's light, there's trouble. (laughs) The neighbors... They looked at him, saw the blind man. He said, ain't that, ain't, ain't, ain't that the guy that was blind? Somebody said, yeah, that's him. <laughs> Somebody said, no, but it looked like him. Because, you know, when God touches your life, oh, y'all going to like this. This alone is worth the price of you coming out in this weather. When God touches your life, you look different. (laughs) You look different. Mm -hmm. You look different. You ever been through a stressful situation and then God touched your life and released that stress? And then people look at you and say, oh, you look different. Yeah, because the touch of God on your life makes you look different. Folk try to figure you out. I had somebody tell me that this week. They said, I just can't figure you out. I said, give your brain a break. Stop trying. <laughs> the wind blows where it wills. You hear the sound thereof. So is everyone that is. Come on, y'all help me. Born of the Spirit. You know, sometimes, you know, sometimes Spirit-led people are unpredictable. You notice that in your wall? Sometimes they're just unpredictable. All right. 
Somebody said, yeah, that's your problem. <laughs> no, that's my blessing. Which is my interpretation of sin. All right. So they say, is that him? He said, no, it's me. So they said, well, how, how, how did your eyes open? He said, well, it was this man called Jesus. He made clay and he anointed my eyes. He said, go wash. And I went and I washed and I came back sin. It's just that simple. God said, do this. I did it. And then God did it. God said it, I did it, then God did it. Say that with me. God said it, I did it, then God did it. You'll be surprised at what God will do when you do what God told you to do. You'll be amazed. Didn't he tell you I'll make a way where there is no way? Did he tell you that? All right. Don't, don't get like the children of Israel in the wilderness get caught on bad reports. Okay. I just heard someone say, stop, Daryl. All right. Now watch. How did your eyes open? Well, this guy told me, go wash. I went and washed, and I came back saying. So they said, well, where is he? He said, I don't even know. I don't know. So they said, well, hmm, we know what to do. Let's take you to the Pharisees. Now the trouble begins. So far, so good. Jesus has unveiled the error. He's corrected misconceptions on faith. So what do they do now? They bring him to the Pharisees. Who are the Pharisees? The Pharisees are those who believe that they're keepers of the kingdom. They got watch over. They think. Say that again. They think so. They forgot. So, so they bring them to the Pharisees. Now watch what happens. It was the Sabbath day. So the Pharisees said, well, how did he receive his sight? They said, well, he put clay on his eyes, and I went and I washed, and now I see. So the Pharisees said, well, this man's not of God. <laughs> he, he, he don't keep the Sabbath. He doesn't follow our rules. He can't be of God. He doesn't do it our way. Do y'all see this or am I making it up? All right. Okay. All right. It's there. I just want to make sure it's there. So now light, true faith, clear understanding of God with this man having this experience with God. Somebody say experience with God. See, what Dayton, Ohio needs, Dayton, Ohio needs some places where people can come in and experience the presence and the power of God. That's what the city needs. Oh, my. All right. And so, they, well, well, well he, 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 he ain't a God. He, ain't, he don't keep our rules. And they didn't even understand the Sabbath. Jesus had to clarify for that. Man was not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. But they got it twisted. And whenever you get things twisted, you're putting folk in bondage. And that's exactly what they did. You don't do it our way, it ain't God. Hmm, oh, I better get off this point here. But I'll stay here a little longer because I'm having fun. This man ain't a God. Pharisees asked. He put clay. So the Pharisee said he ain't a God. (laughs) Now watch this. How can a man that's a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division. You see that? There was a division. Jesus said, don't think I came to bring peace on the earth. I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Because everybody knows what's going to happen when they say peace, right? When they say peace, peace, then sudden destruction is going to come upon them. That's another one of them pieces of Bible we don't like to preach because it don't fit our agenda. Oh, my. Y'all know what I say at this point, right? Dig that hole a little deeper, Daryl. Dig it a little deeper. Hmm. What a division. So they said to the blind man again, what do you say of him? He opened your eyes. He said he a prophet. But the Jews didn't believe concerning him that he had been, you know, blind and received. So they call us, they, 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 they go get his family. We don't believe the man. We don't believe the testimony. We don't care that we can see God moving. We don't care. 
We don't care that people are being touched. We don't care that people are being healed. We don't care that people are being set free and ain't following our agenda. So go call his family. Is that your boy? Yeah, that's him. Well, how did he get his sight? They wouldn't even answer. Because they were so intimidated by the religious system, they couldn't even answer. They couldn't bear witness for Jesus because they were intimidated by religious systems. Don't ever get intimidated by religious systems. You obey God. Is that your boy? Yeah, we think. Well, how was he born blind? We don't know. He is of age. Ask him. That's a powerful statement. Now, now it gets real deep. Why did they say he is of age? Ask him. Because they had already determined if anybody confesses that Jesus is the Christ, we're going to put him out. Put him out of what? We're going to put him out of synagogue. We're going to put him out. So she wouldn't answer. They said, ask him. Let him take his own responsibility for himself. You see, in the final analysis, folks, you're going to have to give an account for yourself. When it's all said and done, ain't nobody being saved in a group. There's no such thing as group salvation. <laughs> we must all appear. Before, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry to throw that out y'all. You know, I didn't mean to put that like that. Yes, I did. There's no such thing as group salvation. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the reward for what we have done. See, when I stand before God and he's answering and, and I got to give an account, I can't start talking about, well, you know, Deb wasn't feeling good on Sunday morning, so I decided to stay home with her. Uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. We all have to answer for ourselves. Because light will even put separation between those that are closest to you. This was his family. This was mom and dad. Better move away from that one. So in this situation the pharisees are interrogating these folks and when the and 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 and, and when the boy confessed he said i didn't told y'all once how he did it you didn't believe me i told you twice you didn't believe it you even threatened to put me out and i'm telling you again my witness is not changing now why you keep asking, do you want to be one of his disciples? Me too. And at that, they begin to, the scripture says, revile him. You were all together born in sin. Who are you to teach us to understand who we are? So light begins to reveal the hypocrisy of religious systems over against a relationship with God. And that's a tough one. You was all together born and said, who are you? I mean, that would, be, that, that would be akin to Carmen got saved, Jesus working in her life, and then she come to, to, to Pastor Josh and I and begin to, to share some things that God has told us or has shown her, and then we sit and we look at her and say, you just got saved. You know, you need to settle down for a little bit, get plugged in, <laughs> you know, go through all of this stuff, then start talking about Jesus. And then she said, well, no, Pastor, that, that, that's not quite right. Then we begin to revile her because, after all, you know, we, we, we got the degrees and the robes as if that impresses God. And it doesn't. It doesn't. It really doesn't. It doesn't. He's happy that we have it, but it, it doesn't impress him. What impresses God is obedience. Hmm. Obedience. Obedience and transparency, because whatever is done in the dark is going to come to the light. I don't know who that's for, but it's for somebody. I'm closing for real this time. So this light revealed the hypocrisy of this religious system that they had going on that killed Jesus, I might say. It's always interesting that every time God creates a movement, religious systems want to kill it. Check church history, folks. Nothing new under the sun. The devil ain't got no new tactics. 
Now, we tend to be ignorant of his wiles, but, you know, because we won't read, but it is what it is. I said, that's why I don't like him. Think he know what he's talking about. That'll hit you on your way home. Last principle, and I'm closing. Then we're going to pray. They put him out. Jesus found him. See, Jesus is always aware of what you're going through. It doesn't matter what you're dealing with. It doesn't matter. Jesus is aware of what you are going through. In the midst of your storm, Jesus is there. In the midst of your challenges, Jesus is there. In the midst of your rejection, Jesus is there. In the midst of your betrayal, Jesus is there. In the midst of folk talking about you, lying on you, and all the other stuff that they do, Jesus is there. And Jesus found the man. And he asked them, do you believe in the Son of God? The man said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe? And Jesus said, you, he that is talking to you now, I am he. And what did the man do? Very simply, he worshiped. You want to get a worshiping community of faith? Let him get to Jesus. Oh, let me say it again. If you want to see a worshiping community, Let them get to Jesus and let Jesus get to them. Now, that might sound strange. What Doesn't that sound strange? To let Jesus get to them. In other words, get out of the way and let God be God. Just get out of the way. Sometimes the greatest barrier to God and his people, (laughs) you figure it out. So Jesus found a man. So Jesus said, for judgment, I'm coming to this world that they which see not might see. And they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with them heard, and they said, are we blind also? Jesus said, well, if you were blind, you you wouldn't have any sin. But now you say, we see, therefore your sin remains. So when light comes... And people begin to think they see, but they reject the light. It's evidence their sin remains, and they're still in darkness. And there's a lot of folk walking around in darkness and don't know. Some, I don't think, care. Then it connects with where Pastor Josh took us last week. This is what prompts Jesus' statement. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, they come up some other way, they're a thief and they're a robber. That's what prompted Jesus' whole discourse on the good shepherd because the Pharisees and the scribes and all of them, they got it twisted. They thought they were. They were the keepers. I was talking to somebody this week, and we were sharing some things. They asked me about something about credentialing or something. I said, well, who, who you got your credentials from? I said, God. They looked at me like I lost my mind. <laughs> God. Yeah, God, you know. The one that sits on the throne. Amen. Amen. See, we got this stuff twisted. We got it all twisted. Who called you? Y'all don't know? Oh, okay. All right, y'all help me out here. (laughs) God can confirm his work. Jesus is light, and what Jesus wants to do, I'm done. What Jesus wants to do is Jesus wants to work in our lives to correct our erroneous understanding of what is and what isn't the work of God. Number two, he wants to reveal how simple he has made this walk of salvation. It's not tough. It's not difficult. It's a life of faith, right? 
by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourself, it's a gift of God. And then he wants to reveal the hypocrisy of religious systems. Don't get caught up thinking that every system is, you know, straightforward. And number four, ah, I love this one. Jesus wants us to understand he is the true shepherd. And if we will follow him, we will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Amen. I trust you are encouraged by the message today, as well as challenged to pursue God's best in your life. To receive additional information about the ministry, visit us online at emergentministries.com. That's iMergentMinistries.com. While there, don't forget to sign up for our newsletter, like us on Facebook, and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and Spreaker. That way, you'll always be updated when new episodes are released. Our web address again is iMergentMinistries.com. That's I-M-E-R-G-E-N-T Ministries.com. Now, if you'd like to join us in a live service, we're located at 4800 North Dixie Drive in Dayton, Ohio. Our service times and other information is posted on the website. Now, once again, thanks for taking the time to listen to the webcast. And remember, you are a person of potential and always pursue God's best.